All right, here we go. Last question with this energy section. We have an infinite cylinder of radius R carries a uniform surface charge sigma. We propose to set it spinning about its axis at a final velocity, angular velocity, omega f. How much work will it take per unit length? Okay, this is going to be fun. Do it two ways and compare your answer. All right, fair enough. So part A, they want us to find a magnetic field and the induced electric field, again in the quasi-static approximation, inside and outside the cylinder. In terms of omega, omega dot, which the omega dot represents uh, the time derivative, and s, the distance from the axis. Again, so we're going to be in <coughs> again, so we're going to be in cylindrical coordinates. Makes sense. Calculate the torque you must exert, and from that, obtain the work done per unit length. Again, we know that the work is equal to um, the torque, the integral of the torque per the uh, rotation, the amount of angles or radians we're rotating about, so d phi. And then, uh, again, since torque is through um, rotation, torque causes rotation, so rotation and uh, angular displacement all makes sense. Uh, classical mechanics, if you forgot. But B, here we use uh, the magnetic field to calculate the energy to determine the energy stored in the magnetic field. Okay, whatever. Let's get to it. Um, we know that it, this looks like a solenoid being a cylinder. So what we have is B is equal to mu naught K, where K is the surface current. Okay, so that's for S inside, but K is on the surface, so be careful. And then we know for solenoid, it's zero outside, so we don't have to worry about much. Now, in order to find a current, what we need to do is have, what is the total charge, which is given by sigma? What is it rotating at since we need charges moving, hence omega? And so since sigma needs a radius, we have to have at the, radi at the surface of the solenoid itself, hence R. So that's how we get the current, surface current. All right, pretty easy there to maneuver with. Now, the electric field we have to be careful from because that comes from Faraday's law. And since we want the induced field, that's equal to the line integral uh, of the electric field with the flux of negative flux, again, since we're being induced. Um, so if we're looking at the electric field on the inside, that's equal to the negative uh, B dot a n where a is the vector area inside the solenoid since phi is equal to b dot the vector area um if we see here then we just take the since the area inside is not time dependent we go ahead and move it outside and we see that the line integral runs uh to 2 pi s all right it's pretty easy there but we also say that a n is some vector with is the area inside so that's again circular so we have pi s squared, where s is some uh, radius inside. And we see that the pi and s cancel left and right. And what's left is finding the derivative of the field. Um, clearly, that could set up two cases for the field inside and outside, playing a role since the field outside is zero. It, we're just using the field on the inside. That's the only place it matters anyways. So let's not get that confused. You could have up to four of these electric fields to consider for the magnetic field being inside and outside. But we'll get to that later. <clears throat> we'll get to that part when we need to. Here, since the magnetic field is only inside, that's the only place we have to worry, so two, set, two electric fields to worry about. Now, the electric field on the outside of the cylinder, using the same method, well, we get two pi s from the line integral again, except the magnetic field, um, and, a, and therefore the flux only runs to the radius big R, or the radius of the cylinder. So you see we don't get the nice cancellations out, except pi's cancel, pretty straightforward. So if we condense this in a piecewise definition, we see that for inside the cylinder, we get negative S over 2, dBdt, again, in the phi hat direction. Uh, again, since they have to be perpendicular to the magnetic field, and then for outside, we have negative R squared 2S over 2S dBdt. So if we take the time derivative of the field, again, this is just a field on the inside, we see that the only thing that changes with time is the um, omega here. So we get omega dot. 
Again, we just combine the R's, so we get uh, R in the numerator for the inside and R cubed in the numerator for the outside. And now we're ready to consider moving forward. With this, we need to know the torque on the surface, and we can find this via the electric field that we just found. Recall that the torque N is equal to R cross F. And R here is equal to uh, some radius, again, at the surface, so we have R in the S hat direction, but the electric force is equal to Q um, times the electric field. And now with that, we can take a cross product pretty easily. So we have R, Q, and E that we could factor out, but we know that E is in the fiat direction, so we go ahead and put that in there. We know that S cross phi hat gives us Z hat in the cylindrical system, so we're good there. Uh, again, R stays R. The charge is equal to the uh, surface distribution, so sigma times the surface area of a cylinder, which is 2 pi R, over the length of the cylinder. All right, and then for E, we have, again, at the surface. So if we're using either part of the piecewise definition, we have an S going to R. Hence the double R in the numerator there. Again, we have a minus sign and a mu naught sigma uh, omega dot all in the Z hat direction. So this is our torque, pretty good to go. And we see that this simplifies down after we cancel twos and combine everything. We get negative pi mu naught sigma squared R to the fourth omega dot L in the Z hat direction. Now, since we want the work per unit length, that's the uh, W divided by L which again, we have W is equal to N D phi in the integral formulation. So we have a factor of L that we can factor outside and put as a fraction. Um, with that, we see that the L's cancel, again, as to be expected. And now we see that pretty much everything here, except for the omega, is a constant. The reason why is because what we'll see in the next step is that we know that omega dot is equal to D omega over DT, but omega and the angular displacement are related pretty uniquely. Again, if we remember from uh, basic mechanics, we see that the angular displacement is equal to the angular velocity times time. So if we take the derivative, we see that we have d phi is equal to omega dt. With that, we can go ahead and plug in omega dt into the integral that we have and cancel the dt's. Again, slightly hand wavy but it's what we do as physicists. Here, then, we're left with omega at d omega, which is perfect since we're going from a, a resting point up, the, up to omega f as our final angular velocity. That's a simple integral. You just get omega squared, omega f squared over 2, and simplify through. Now you see that you get negative mu naught pi over 2 times sigma r squared omega f all squared pretty compact for what could have been very messy. Again, this seems to be a bit more of a physical situation where we can measure better in a lab. Now, let's consider that this is the work done by the field. The work you must do does not include the minus sign. Again, so if this is the work by the field, the work we must do has to counteract that. So if you actually want the work we're doing, that's a positive work. We're putting energy into that system to get it running. So we use the field to calculate the opposite case, and therefore we can move forward. All right, so for B, since the field is uniform inside and zero outside, the magnetic field that is, <clears throat> we can find the work quickly. Okay, again, take the uh, uh, W divided by L, where W is equal to the uh, B squared, the uh, energy from the B field, which is B squared D tau. We know that the D tau runs from zero to L, zero to two pi, zero to R. We've seen a setup before, no big deal. Run it through, let's start canceling. We see that a factor of mu cancels, a factor of L cancels. We get a two canceling for the two pi and the R squared. And then we get this weird gross looking fraction, uh, which we can therefore condense back into mu naught pi uh, over two. Uh, again, in parentheses, we have sigma R squared omega F all squared and we sit both of the uh, answers are the exact same, and that's exactly what we expect. Don't you just love it with how consistent this theory is? It's one of the most consistent and why it's used so heavily.